Introducing <laughs> fighting the most out of the pink corner. Last week. <laughs> pink corner. Good morning, I Misfits. Pop my top off. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Misfit Podcast. And the Goon Squad. Oh, <laughs> Keep it rolling, Ted. Fuck. Rolling. Oh shit. We gotta get some. Uh, we just have one, two, make you guys three, listen to four, that the four, entire one, time. Two, three. Yeah. <laughs> hey guys, how are you? Keep it quietly in the background. Oh, I'm gonna be Turn worse. Shut up! I can't hear stops. it. I'm deaf. On, that, give me that recorder solo. <laughs> Did you buy one of those in yeah, fucking like third grade? That's the hook. <laughs> yeah. On today's episode, we're gonna I be talking one. about everything related to the 2024 CrossFit Games Open. Ooh. But before we do that, we've got live chat. And as always, the best way to support this podcast is by heading to properfuel.co. Use the code word misfit. Sharpentheaxco.com. Use your favorite athlete code. Misfit Athletics for your individual programming needs and Team Misfit for your affiliate programming needs. Life chat. Hunter, you said you had a, a burning question for the group. Yeah, well, I got a... It's unclear what time zone Mike Macaluso is in. I think he's in like mountain received, time right now. Does it he exist a, in a particular time zone? I re, uh, no, he exists maybe, outside maybe of time zones. <laughs> Hope, hopefully. Um, at 3.09 a.m., Jesus Christ. What would you say is the best measure of endurance in CrossFit? A single test can be multimodal, to which I responded with my typical, give me some more specifics and clarifying questions, which he has not replied yet. So I'll give the quali- the classification of this. It should be a either a pre-existing like CrossFit benchmark or test or event, not like you're not just going to program it right now. Mm. What is the single best test of endurance for a CrossFit athlete? And I'll maybe I'll just run my suck for a second while you guys think. Yeah, I mean, I've, there's clearly been, not an actual answer to this question, so it's just a fun thing to to go yeah, through. Yeah, right? my my because I mean my am- the semantics are, are they run deep. They're at, yeah, and they're actually important. And I so I kind of just going with the general definition what we people generally perceive as endurance but my immediate thought it has to be some either exclusively or involve a heavy dose of locomotion is what i said basically like running or weight bearing walking i think like a ruck or like a you know a burden style run uh whether it's just like cover but basically like the foundation of crossfit move large loads long distances quickly like put something on your back walk for a long time there's an L I, I think like there's that that can be that's kind of like where I, I would probably build that potentially that recency of, bias but the event that comes to mind that puts a very good crossfit spin on an endurance event is the capital yeah, just thinking about thinking opening the with the pig and then a lot of the athletes that got there that really led the charge in the run then had some serious issues with the weightlifting implements um you know, there's we, we had something similar way back um, with the uh, what was the burden run workout called that had the pig ish type. I think it was just the burden run talking about oh, the my, log yeah. that Jason threw yeah. the yeah. shoulder yeah. across his yeah. back. Yeah, it was like 2013. Yeah. That sled at the end was so funny to watch too. I actually, what's interesting about this is I won't I won't name any names, but there are CrossFit athletes who dominate longer crossfit events um that are much more traditional crossfit that do not do very well when there is more running more biking things of that nature and that's why i think we have to pull some of these elements in there's some athletes with just that really really high athlete iq um that have really good movement efficiency that understand the difference between like the cadence of movements that allows them to, you know, stay in line with everybody else and then where to push and where not to push. So I need a heavy dose of traditional endurance sport mixed with CrossFit, I think. 
Yeah. I think that's where we would probably find the answer to that. Triple three is low, my answer. Low skill, low skill implements say, sure? without a... I said triple threes is my answer. I really Oof. like like that workout. I like that the time domain still fits within the, I don't know, crossfit feel. Like, and obviously an endurance event can go anywhere from fucking five minutes all the way to forever to, you know, Leadville 100 or some shit like that. But I liked that that was how well can you stay moving on something that like everybody could basically do there and people who pace that the well and the pace that the best and were the toughest essentially shook out. And I also love that the fittest man in history, so to speak, wasn't able to do it. Now that might've been related to an injury, but he competed the rest yeah, of the weekend. Yeah, you think so. he's the fittest man in history. Um, I sure as fuck don't. <laughs> That's right. Fuck. Sorry. Are we going to get in Let's that fight. conversation again? I would say uh, no, <laughs> because I know why Sherb thinks that. I don't even think it's relevant to the conversation, so we can't do that again. Sure. I would say I think s- actually you're on sitting, his team, though. Sitting in okay. the stands for the marathon I am. row is probably... <laughs> The greatest test of the yeah. greatest We're test so of the greatest test. Did you win? That's I mean, the, that's the, me yeah, the greatest test Riley of the CrossFit spectator good. is the is the marathon yeah. row. We turned it into a drinking game. Every time Kenzie stood up, we had to drink. How many drinks you take? Quite quite a few. Fuck! Quite God few. damn it, Kenzie! <laughs> Sit on the fucking rower. She needed a smash pack, bro. <laughs> smash pack. <laughs> I can't. I can't I think to look of. I can't think of anything else. Would like, like what about I, I, I was, I was thinking that? Pendleton. What was what, one yeah, and two. the Pendle, Pendleton one and two is the other one I was thinking of. That mm-hmm. involves I think like in more from thinking more of it from a like a traditional CrossFit standpoint, I, I like the the variability of the terrain as well. So a little bit more kind of like what real life application workout? of fitness. I'm trying to remember. It was like it was a it was a mini mini triathlon, swim, run, bike, wasn't it? Or swim, swim bike, run, bike. Run. Or is, yeah, I can't remember if it's bike or run, which one was first. But basically, I like the unknown element, too, of the swim. Like, most of those athletes at that point weren't really trained to swim. So what the year was that? Was that 14? 13. Thir- it was 12? 12? That was 13. 700-meter so swim, 8-kilometer bike, 11-kilometer run. Yeah, I like that a lot. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Is that 12, Ted? Uh, that was... Is there an insinuation, though, if someone yeah. can walk in off the yeah. street that could not participate in the CrossFit Games, that that's not the best endurance test for a CrossFitter? I like the idea that the fittest CrossFitter is going to shake out near the top there, like that Numi dude. Like, you're right, he didn't win the CrossFit I mean, Games. I mean, we used to get the endurance athletes at the beginning would be at the top of the leaderboard every single year, and then they would disappear oh, yeah. completely. Sometimes mm-hmm. end up all the way down between 30 and 40. I feel like there's got to be some kind of weighted implement in order to prove that you've got other modal modalities of endurance, yeah. like muscle endurance. And I do, I do think it's literally just that so many people ran well to the capital and then kind of fell apart. I think that that makes my mind go there. I'm not saying that like they couldn't come up with a better one and there isn't like a more traditional rounds for time type of workout. Um, or something that's I don't know like there's a lot of that workout is very stretched out and is obviously extremely run heavy um but I just like the idea of that sort of implement being involved whether it is like you said Hunter carrying something or something to that effect because again we have a few really good examples of like perennial top 10 games athletes that if they had more endurance they would probably win the CrossFit games there's a handful of them that just don't really have that part. Um, and then there's vice versa. There are the top 10 athletes who are very endurance heavy that don't do as well, maybe in the heavy lifting or whatever. Um, so I think it's an what interesting was... question when you take maybe spots like four through 10, you can find out a lot about what's a really good test. And then your one, two, and three, it's actually a pretty good segue for the open. Cause I went through today and, looked at open scores for like the best of the best and like how do pretty fucking well in the open <laughs> you know the people that oh. win the crossfit games or go in and because i think there's an insinuation Weird. there are a lot of top 10 athletes once again that don't do well in the open they're just sort yeah, of I mean, like uh, is what it is super super old school crossfit glassman talked about like we already know who the fittest person on earth is after the open like we don't even need regionals or the crossfit games to figure that out and that might might be slightly maybe slightly different now but i think if 
if the open were treated like with the same level of intensity as the CrossFit games. And let's say it was actually like a reasonably well-rounded open. It wouldn't surprise me to learn that. I mean, they throw like, a lift in there and Adler wins, right? I think he's won twice in the short format version of the open. Yeah. And it was because he was able to go lift. His own diet? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> 12 almonds. Is, eight, is 8X fat every single day. I I have wanted to go on a tangent for the zone diet thing for a while, just because everyone right now is like, you don't need carbs to do CrossFit, and like the original prescription from CrossFit was forty thirty 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 thirty. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm confused. I don't understand. Forty grams of carbs is what I meant per day. That's all you need. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> who's saying who's saying you, you don't need breathing? carbs to do CrossFit? There's a, I don't know. There's a lot of just like a movement against carbs. Extremely so dogmatic, like views in CrossFit right now. There's a few, it's a handful of content creators that like come up with a theory and then hold the line. And yeah. like, if you're seen eating a Snickers bar, I think you would get excommunicated. And the funny thing is, they probably Shot. all eat. They probably all eat Snickers bars. They just don't tell anyone about, about it. Butterfingers. I don't tell anyone. Sure. I don't tell anyone. Sherb's like, Fuck, just kidding. One? They're not Snickers. They're Butterfingers. <laughs> oh, you guys got one? <laughs> do I have one? Yeah, sure, do you ask it. if I want one? No, no, Sherb, do you, have you think? One. Do you think that if you wrote a workout to match the question, that it would have any sort of weighted implement in it, or do, are you taking this as like a straight up endurance is endurance? I mean, I agreed with what Hunter said about a ruck or a vest. I think those are fine implements. There, I like the. <clears throat> I like the additional challenge there. I don't necessarily love the, I don't know, the weighted thing. Like the, the capital is a really cool workout, but like it feels too crossfitty to be like an endurance test. Like Mike asked, like, I don't know. It just doesn't feel like it fits in line. Can you, with can that. you say what his question was again though? Yeah, I, the, I felt like he was insinuating something with the question. Well, it, it's kind of, it's interesting. Cause I, I, what Sherb just said is kind of what I, thought uh, it was like so th what would you say is the best measure of endurance in crossfit a single test can be multimodal the best measure of endurance in crossfit so again like it's not to like to kind of play devil's advocate to your point drew it's like well i'm not necessarily trying to find the test that Jeff Adler wins the endurance event, right? Like it's still going to be like it's an if it's an endurance event, it should like in theory the fittest crossfitter who is endurance like, you know, if Sam Briggs wins the endurance event, it's not it's like well, she's one of the fittest humans on the planet, but sure. obviously a little bit skewed towards the endurance side of the thing. Yeah, so you could tweak if, that question a few ways and I'd stand at the podium and, you know, campaign for any one of those things yeah. for sure i think my I, I like the i think the capital is like i like the framework for it is probably something like the capital i don't know that i i do kind of agree that i feel like maybe uh like any person should be able to like do the event i think it should it should lack skill uh, it, like there's no skill it's just grunt work and and a combination of stamina and cardiorespiratory endurance you know we can pick like the however many of the physical skills apply to just kind of that niche of endurance and um the pigs the i guess the pig just maybe requires enough skill and like brute strength that i don't know it, it certainly blurs the line and by crossfit's definition is certainly an endurance event but yeah i thought it was an interesting question i like the triple threes too because you can like there's an element of like cut like a like you need significant capacity to do well in that event like it's pretty much accessible to oh, most yeah, people course. save the save like the skill of the double under but in order to do well in that event and go hard like man every time i fucking do that over the summer here it floors me how horrendous i feel that less fit every time is. i do it i'm like what the <laughs> fuck like like i've never run a slower less comfortable three miles in my life than after a 3k row and 300 double unders yeah i Good think question. yeah the i think i typically work backwards in these scenarios like we already know who the fittest are and what separates them 
in an endurance type of an event if you throw some sort of crossfit curveball in. Um, now, if you were... The other part of this, too, is like I would want to know if he's asking for himself, then I want to know who the athlete <laughs> is. You know what I mean? Sure, yeah, like, yeah. Like if someone's amazing at CrossFit, it's like fuck you. You're not touching anything weighted. <laughs> like you're gonna you're gonna right. get on machines and you're gonna do you know very you know close to monostructural type movements within this. Um, or in a lot of cases, people message me fairly often uh, for confirmation bias. They're arguing with someone and they're like, <laughs> "Hey, I'm trying want to win some- an argument," and I'm like thinking to myself, "Am I gonna give them the answer that they want?" And, it, and typically they don't respond if I give them an answer that they don't want. I find that to be kind of a funny <laughs> That's always great. They just deleted yeah. the chat to delete the <laughs> yeah. evidence. Did like, you ask him? Ask, no. I didn't ask no, that didn't respond, him. dick. Nah, I never replied. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm smarter. What um, about uh, what about an event like, or what about a workout like, Sherb, correct me if I'm wrong on my benchmark here. Is it EVA? Five rounds, 400 meter run, 30 wall ball, 30 box jumps? It's, I think it's 800 meter run. You think of Kelly? Kelly's Eva the box was jumps. The one with the um, Eva's the heavy kettlebell swings. swings. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah, Kelly's Eva's the 400. 800s pull ups and heavy kettlebell swings. That's a fucking kick in the dick. That would be a killer. That workout's games rough. Event. Um, that would be a good fifty games. fucking hand rippers. But uh, yeah, no, I think then it was Kelly. Yeah, it's Kelly. Kelly's the four hundred, the thirty box jumps, thirty wall balls. Thirty box jump, thirty wall balls. Probably so not long. Trish enough, comes in and waxes all of us in every year. I think I think that's that might be the work that might be the like affiliate level like crossfitter sort of thing nah, but it's king kong, king kong. Well, <laughs> the least fit crossfitter on the planet got anything else for life chat gents oh uh, we got uh yeah we just got a shout out seamus real quick who sent us some your nickname, dope big coffee fella? so thanks seamus shut the fuck up sure <laughs> i'm gonna read, read the, the packing, card i'm gonna read the read. packing slip here which <laughs> almost yet, which excited. almost got uh almost got put in the uh the trash but glad it didn't hey guys appreciate you all here's something to fill the mugs best from seamus thank you seamus p.s and so two of the coffees are called one of them is called big truck and one of them is called little buddy P.S. Big Truck who? versus Little Buddy is the alternative title for Hunter v. Sherb. <laughs> who's who? <laughs> Big Truck. Ah, yeah. Thank you for the coffee, Seamus. Get fucked. Respect. <laughs> <laughs> it's good coffee but too. It is good coffee. Is good coffee. Yeah. I've only I've mm-hmm. only had one of the brews so far. I herniated seventy four discs sneezing. Um, the other day, Fuck. so I haven't been back in. Um, that's my life chat. I am actually back in my office right now, but I didn't think that I could sit. If you're watching on YouTube, I didn't think I could sit in my chair for an hour and a half. So I'm um, feet up currently on the on the couch in the corner. It took me four and a half hours to strap this microphone to a coffee table. Are you going to devolve at some point to having to lay flat on your couch with your computer like on your chest doing one of like these guys? So the only thing that has fully like made my QLs let go is laying on my acupressure mat. Mm-hmm. So I I have been working on the ground on that with my feet up on the couch and I put a pillow under my head to like tuck my chin and I have my laptop on my like stomach slash oh, chest. Yeah. It's, That's full it's fucking stuff. slag mode. <laughs> yeah. Slag mode. <laughs> yep. Yeah. My, for, for like the first four days, even with four doses a day of muscle relaxers, it felt like everything across my low back was bone. Oof. Like you could That's not hot. push into my QLs at all. <laughs> Mai was like, isn't that your spine? And I was like, no, no. That's the like the mushy thing that's supposed my to be next spine to my is spine. Growing. Tight, tight muscles, a strong muscle, as they say. So <laughs> yeah. maybe you got that yeah. going for you. Well, you yeah, I mean, back, back when I would rip through some uh, dog shitting deadlifts, my QLs were crazy. Cause they like, I was only using my QLs and they would like fill with blood immediately at the beginning of a workout. So I would look like I had those thunder sticks, um, that you used to get at, at fucking those sporting events. Two fucking pieces of rebar attached to Austin's yeah. back. Yeah. yeah. My fucking tenderloins were looking good. <laughs> They're full of rough. 
Your yeah. body just sniffed a kettlebell and it just sent blood straight to your erectors. <laughs> yeah. Every time I walk into the gym. Look out. He's getting ready to go. <laughs> oh, fuck. Not turn, off the, turn off the glutes and hamstrings. We don't need them. We're choosing photos for our lobby and we're going to do one photo from for every year from 2009 through 2024. And then that'll be something that we keep ongoing at the gym. And some of the photos from... 2009, 2010 in my parents' garage, you can see how I'm really working on my back muscles. I'm looking yeah. fucking real good. Yeah. Working on your bowels too at the same time? It, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> pre Was that pre-gluten, Drew? I was even... Yeah, so speaking of the zone diet, there are a few photos that make <laughs> me look absolutely fucking shredded, and that's because uh, when you mix the zone diet, Human especially with the syndrome. blocks they recommend, and you have IBS, um, you get fucking shredded, bro. Although, nice. throw a t-shirt on me, and I look like a skeleton. So, like, I only look decent if I pop my top off. Otherwise, it was like, he literally just made of bones. <laughs> where is he? Bone like, man. Where, where did he Fucking go? bone man. All right, guys, and bring then, it around the whiteboard. Drew dumps his shirt. Like, oh, what? Sorry, 20, I thought we were working out. <laughs> 2012, I figured out what was going on. I weighed 160. 2013, I weighed 185. Nice. 185 is good. Yeah, 185 is a little bit better for my size, I'd say. 160 was a little weird. The photos are creepy. My head looks huge. Yeah, that's some <laughs> mechanic. And then pre zone diet, I just looked like I was melting. Speaking of huge heads, did anybody watch the fights this weekend? Someone's mm -hmm. head explode. So Henry Cejudo's back. And I don't know if you've ever seen Henry Cejudo, but he's mm -hmm. like five feet tall, five two, I think. His head Such a is beast, though. the size of a seven foot man's head. It's How the, the fuck craziest. Do you spell his name? <laughs> Cejudo. It's C E J U D O. I haven't what? watched a lot of fighting oh, because yeah, I won't stay up late dude. enough to watch it in oh, years. Yeah, especially and, views. and he's he's from the time when I did watch. Yeah, so he was the he was the even, champ champ. He's trying to come back and yeah. get a belt again, but he got Did he run beat Mighty Mouse? Through. Yeah, that's how he got his belt. Yeah, he was the one. One of the best pound for pound fighters in the history of the UFC. But yeah. no, Henry Cejudo got run through this weekend. But his head he is huge gigantic. Head. <laughs> it's like they took a normal sized person and then just squished him down, but they left his head. If I remember, Five, he's four. got like a block head too, doesn't he? Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah he's got one of those yeah, big dumb heads. He's got a, yeah. Yeah. yeah, he's got a big he head. He looks he looks like um what are the bobbleheads that they yeah. make nowadays? Yeah. Bob bobbleheads? Like yeah. Nah, it's like uh, hipster shit. I've got a bunch of them in my basement. There's like a brand name for them. These ones? Yeah. Yeah. That's what he is. Pop Funko <laughs> Pop. What is that thing? It's a Funko Pop. His is, is more, I would Funko say, Pop? vertical. Vertical. It's He's got more vertical. Uh, like, what is that? I want to pay the vertical, Manning the vertical Funko dimension Pop. is higher. Right it's now. Argyle from Stranger Things. The pizza friend. Oh sure yeah get it together bro <laughs> <laughs> fucking idiot fucking nerds <laughs> all right then should i we play done? the song again is that, no. play that fucking sure. song <laughs> the play that, sure, the the podcast. Oh. told you that i can't move we talked about the endurance events i mean i've spent um, the last like week playing referee between my two kids because my oldest just likes to fucking body slam and punch and <laughs> kick and drag right. around the house the youngest one Ted's so, so like, excited right now. That's great. <laughs> How's Any the other one faring? Is he is he bulking not up? Not so he, great. No? Not so great. He's uh he's pretty sad. It's, it's almost like you can he can sense a little bit of fear when his brother's around because yesterday he spent the day at my mom's house and I was like, Lincoln's never been more chill than today. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a. Uh, How old is the small one? one? He's uh, ten months. He'll be a year in like six weeks. So you like can't that. really give him a pep I'll talk. Come over and, and teach like, him some shank little brother shit. You gotta lay on your back and kick as hard as you can. Come yeah, down no, here. Try and fucking come down here. See how that oh, goes, man. pal. Yeah, no, he needs a <laughs> he needs a lesson or two because it's just fuck. It. Like I know it's part of development, but I'm like, God damn it, quit being so goddamn mean. And I'm not gonna scream or yell at the old one and be like, Hey, you're like three years old, you know how to express yourself. So like so you're just doing your thing. But fuck. Playing that referee blows dick. Get him a so mean. Bag. He's so mean. And then it's just like a sermon is you know. Certain his dominance, just trying to be the older brother, but fuck, he like he'll see him just like finally pull himself up against the couch, you know, run over, grab him by the waist, and just throw him on the floor, <laughs> and his head will go like, <laughs> Jesus, oh. Oh. amazing. 
Yeah, Damn. so I, sp I spend my entire weekend. So like, I try not to do anything on the weekends besides hang out at home because I'm away from them so much during the week that like I just literally spent 48 hours of torture of the older one torturing the younger one. It's like, I can't wait for you guys to go to nap in different times of the day. So only one of you is up. So you're not killing each other constantly in one direction, killing him the entire time. Lincoln's going to be tough, though. I think so. I mean, if not, he's going to get a callus on his head from hitting off the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck, dude. It's been so mean. I'm like, Damn. and I'm like, Zion, like, is it naughty or nice to throw your brother down? He's like, naughty. And then he like smiles and laughs. I'm like, <laughs> you're not getting this. <laughs> oh, he's getting it. Uh, yeah, it's a good <laughs> fucking, fucking time. Try. You're not fucking getting it. <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> but yeah, he, uh, he now, Zion now knows the theme song to DuckTales, which is pretty great. He only really watches like, old cartoons like that's the only thing we let them watch at our house like old like fucking bugs bunny which are crazy and appropriate and hilarious and all like ducktales <laughs> fucking those cartoons. are the fucking goat those cartoons Dude. are the fucking tits it was so good but now he fucking knows how to sing that song which is amazing so yeah but good. it's weird because our parents didn't pay attention to us when we were mm. sitting on the floor watching tv and now you're in the mode of like actually paying attention to your kids so you're watching it and you're like is this should i bro <laughs> He's watching so fucking Pepe Le Pew, like watch out, bro. He's teaching oh, you yeah. some bad <laughs> habits. Yeah, yeah. yeah don't like act only like needs know if you're stronger. It's like Jesus, Pepe, chill out. <laughs> Pepe, yeah, that guy's got some fucking problems. <laughs> <laughs> fucking take it Fuck. easy. All right, you guys ready for the open chat? That wasn't open chat. Born ready. Oh, sorry. No. Oh, yeah, I thought we were done. So <laughs> outro music. Think, Ted hit it. <laughs> I think there's an insinuation of. If you're listening to this podcast, you're probably going to sign up for the open, right? I think like, can so. we skip that part? I don't. I don't want to trigger you sign guys. I know you guys want to give your you? sign up for the open speech. No, um, if, if you want to get that out of the way now, you can. Um, but my question is: if we go, <laughs> go down the line, so we're skipping over that part. You're listening to this podcast. We've already got you. What should a competitive CrossFitter hope to get out of the open? And we can go like line by line here. But like we started an open athlete. Like we got a bunch of them here at the gym. We got a bunch of them listening to the podcast. Like, what should they be trying to get out of it? As opposed to just like, okay, this is when I get to compare myself, I'm gonna go in, get it done, and move on. It's a yearly check in. You get a chance to see how you did last year, what you learned from last year's experience and how that has changed your fitness for the better same or worse since last year so you know we go throughout our our season and we work on different things like muscle endurance then we work on gas then we work on cardio workouts and you have a chance to kind of train all these things and see improvements and then essentially the open is the expression of all the hard work you've put in throughout the year so i think it's nice to go into one of those workouts and see what lessons you've learned from the previous year and did you actually make action items after last season so that you wouldn't get stuck in the same places this season. And people can make the counter argument there like, hey, the tests are always different, so how is that real? But a lot of them have a, you know, as we like to say, workouts have stimuli, the movements are sort of interchangeable there. It's the stimulus that the workout you know, provides you, which is why it's a good test. So I, I think a lot of that is just comes down to like, what did you learn last year? And you know, did you do your homework in the last 12 months? I think for the competitive CrossFitter, it's especially with the the open, you know, 20, what is it? 25%, 75%. Every single 99%. person on the planet goes to quarterfinals now, whatever, whatever it is. It's, uh, <laughs> every like person. every, everyone does. Everyone owes CrossFit hundred dollars. Um, it's more, I think it's more about, it's more of a competitive tune up. It's like, Hey, you're not training anymore. You're testing. It's let's apply the knowledge that we've gained, whether that's, you know, through the training, like through the last few phases, training stimulus, trying to apply the knowledge of like, okay, I've got 21 muscle ups. Like what's the best way to break this up based on, you know, my, my training over the last few months, maybe a previous training piece or whatever it is, and actually applying your athlete IQ into something that matters, um, even more so than maybe like a local competition or an off season competition. Cause, cause ultimately like, I, I think like the CrossFit season remains the, like the event you can say like, Hey, Wadapalooza is like really important to me or Dubai is really important to me or insert big competition here. Ultimately, like unless something drastic changes, eyes are on the CrossFit 
competitive season, like the CrossFit sponsored competitive season. So, um, the open, I think is the, is the like competitive tune up. It's, is the intensity there is my, are my procedures is my warm up, my cool down, my, you know, my planning kind of ahead as to how, how this workout's going to go from an execution standpoint. Um, and then as my notes, yeah, he's still the actual the line in his first answer. Thief. Yeah. Sorry. Then the, you know, it's, <laughs> it's all of the other, the, the thing it's the, it's the warm up. It's the, is my mobility good? Is it, am I primed for this workout? Do I need to keep, do I need to go back and do some more warming up or whatever it is? And then, you know, post workout that the whole, you know, the cool down procedure refueling and stuff like that. Not as worried as much about, you know, whether you need to redo or not. Like I think for a lot of athletes, maybe the stress of not having to redo uh, for the most part might be a, might be a net positive in the sense that, Hey, we're not so worried as much about like redoing this, but we are worried about, giving our best effort it's not just just do the workout to do it because if you if you go into it with that mindset and quarterfinals is the first time that you decide to turn on the intensity or the give a shit factor like doesn't yeah then it's too late as a lifelong meathead the a worldwide leaderboard is the fucking coolest shit ever like from yeah like you just don't get that opportunity um I, I couldn't believe that it was real and it was a thing when it started back in 2011 and the implications of who you were competing against didn't really, we didn't have the context for it quite yet. Um, it took a handful of years for CrossFitters to realize that a competitive CrossFitter needs to train a different way um, than, you know, someone following com, And like, I just think if you're going to pay to follow competitive programming and you're going to listen to this podcast on a regular basis. You're going to do all these things um, like really giving in to that idea that you get one opportunity each year to compare yourself to every single other person that is after this same pursuit as you, um, including the fittest people on earth is like absolutely incredible. So if we start, at open athlete, someone who will not move on, like you, there's just, you don't get the same opportunities in other sports, in other physical pursuits. Um, And I think that like really leaning into that and taking it seriously, um, I actually think everyone should take it seriously. And um, if you know me personally, you know that I'm not like a traditional HQ Larry kind of guy. But I, I really think that the Open is beneficial from a competitive standpoint for so many reasons. You already alluded to it, Hunter, but we move on to the quarterfinals athlete. And, like, this is an, a, an incredible dress rehearsal because it's ran yeah. by, like, the people, the expectations that you have for how you're going to need to, like, put tape lines down and read the standards and film your workouts and honestly even like think about the way that you're going to consume content and the timing of like okay like i'm gonna go in and i'm gonna watch you know the misfit like movement tips and how am i supposed to warm up for this thing like all of that stuff gets going during this period of time and then what changes this year that i think is really cool is we go through the open and then we get to start that little five week quarterfinals peaking schedule and it's like, we're going to check in, we're going to see where our head's at, we're going to see where you know our endurance is at, maybe a skill or two, where our strength is at. Then we get to lean into this program, prioritize intensity, lift some heavy weights, and then we get to go back to quarterfinals and be like, okay, like I got, you know, I got my hands dirty a little bit. I went back and worked on some things over a period of time where I actually could, you know, get my mind right and prioritize the things in my life that I need to, and then come back and get after it. I think you have to, especially as a quarter, I mean, I I can make the argument for any level of open participant, but the, the level of intensity that you give these workouts just has to be present for, for that quarterfinals athlete. Like how, how many athletes do you know personally or otherwise that perform really well, 
like in training pieces and are just a fucking disaster when it comes to the open, whether it's because of the way that the workout was structured, there's a legitimate deficiency. What's the, you know, where's the, um, where's the gap as far as the intensity goes? Sorry, fucking lost my train of thought with a text message here. <laughs> um, but the, where, like, where's the gap? Why, why is it that you're so good in training, but not when it comes to the open? Cause ultimately like the open, hopefully is nothing that you haven't seen before save the odd you know new movement but rarely is that new movement the the sticking point for somebody at a certain level like for an affiliate athlete maybe a new movement throws a a wrench into the the system but for most like there's nothing that's going to show up in the open that isn't relatively easy to adapt to fairly quickly uh and then execute at high intensity and i think that that is still a missing piece for a lot of aspiring athletes is that level of intensity it's like you worked so hard on getting super strong you worked so hard on being able to string sets of 10 muscle ups together and here's some power <clears throat> snatches and double unders you know that what Enjoy. Drew, you kind of talk about drew it's like we spend so much time on these the shiny objects and then the open comes around and it's like yep Wall walks and double unders. Let's see what your fitness looks like. Yeah, Still here's suck your at toast to bar. Oops. I think you're muted. Um, see, I'm muted. Now we just can't hear you. Drew's oh, dead. Sick. Uh, I'm here. Are you dead? Um, My back is broke. Sure, semi-finals but you're dead too. athlete. What can a semi-finals athlete expect or hope to get out of the open? I have an answer to this question. If you don't, I can't hear anyone, Ted. What? You can't hear anyone? I can hear I you just fine. I can't hear you now. We can all hear you just fine. Fucking loser. Oh, there we go. Sorry. What the fuck is going on here? Bless you. Isn't Drew, tight. Could you repeat the question for Hunter? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. All right. So we've moved on to semifinals athletes. What can a semifinals athlete hope to get out of the open? And my answer to this is based on the fact that they're a bunch of fucking nutcases. No offense. I mean, a check in relative There's to the some... field, I think, is important. Yeah, but also, like, I think that low stakes dress rehearsal because they act wild during quarterfinals. I'm talking people who could do quarterfinals with no shoes or the shoes are on backwards. They could blindfold. They would have to try not to qualify for semifinals and they get weird. They get real weird. I've never there's yelling, done there's before. tears. I think I'm going to retire, things of this I- nature. We need to back <laughs> this out another you know another full section just like we did with the quarterfinals athletes and say the open is a place where you practice dealing with this anxiety of being compared to absolutely everybody else if you're zoomed in to like the affiliate athlete doing the open we're we're concerned about fitness and you know making sure we're hitting movement standards for example and and giving it the best we expand that out to quarterfinals athletes it's Hey, the open is now a, a the best dress rehearsal you're going to have for your Super Bowl, which is quarterfinals. You expand that circle out further to the semifinals crowd. I think it's exactly what you said, Drew, and it's it's obviously less, way less about fitness and capacity, and almost exclusively the, you know, if if there was an eleventh general physical skill in CrossFit, it's the you know, is it mental toughness? Is it you know, athlete psychology? Is it what whatever it is? But once you get to that level, obviously, it's way less about fitness and more about what goes on between the ears. And again, the open is, like you said, I think that low stakes version of quarterfinals. And for the athlete who could qualify for semifinals with their shoes on their head, quarterfinal, you know, the open is a dress rehearsal for quarterfinals is the dress rehearsal for, you know, the big show for most athletes at semifinals. I don't sure disagree. Doing, <laughs> I don't disagree. The the reps thing is important. I, I the competing's a skill. The more you do it, the easier it gets. The more you realize there are patterns to good performances versus less good performances. So I mean, I don't really have too much to add to what Hunter said other than the fact that like it's a rep. You need to get opportunities to do that. And I like the anxiety inducing portion of the competitive season because it is something you'll have to deal with in the moment at a competition in person. So if you can't deal with it inside the comforts of your, you know, the four walls of your affiliate or your garage gym, it's not very likely you can do it outside of there. CrossFit Games athlete, 
What can a CrossFit Games athlete hope to get out of the CrossFit Open? I think it's probably for the Open itself is a little bit more of just kind of a, a mental shift as far as like from a calendar perspective almost. It's like we're no longer in off-season mode. We're in we're in season. Um, and maybe it's maybe it's not even – like it's still early season, but I think it's a little bit more of just a mind sh- mindset shift where it's like, like Sherb alluded to, it's like you do have a compare a leaderboard, a worldwide leaderboard to compare yourself to. And it's like the early stages of like, okay, like where's everyone at? Like, where am I at? What am I, what am I doing here? I think another important aspect to like all of these stages of competition, what I mentioned about the, the intensity, like you're not only going hard to see where you stack up on the leaderboard but like how many of you surprise yourself with a pr lift or a set of a gymnastics movement in an open or quarterfinals workout that you had never ever done in training because the intensity the the lights were on and like it wasn't it just wasn't necessarily there in training but it turns out your capacity is significantly different than what you thought it was And it's an opportunity for maybe a CrossFit Games athlete to like update that a little bit as far as like, okay, like this is my training capacity. This is my competition capacity. And we can now start to build kind of off of that understanding that maybe there's another gear that's hidden within the athlete that doesn't always come out, doesn't get brought out very often during kind of off season training. I think the cleanliness and execution of a run is really important for those athletes too, because they obviously have the requisite fitness. They've been to the CrossFit games. They perform well in person. Can they think through the event? How clean can the run be and how clean or how close to their expectation of how they will do relate to how they actually perform. And they can evaluate that and use that. Like you said, sort of like a tune up, but also like, how dialed You're talking about you minimizing errors. Yeah, sort of yeah, because like, like strategic or like execution a, errors. Yeah, yeah, like going back to the power snatch double under. You, you know, you, even if you have a crazy amount of or you have capacity in fitness, but you trip on every second set of double unders, like you lose two or three seconds. You lose two, three seconds, and those athletes are obsessed with the one percent and that you know the difference between getting ten rounds and nine and a half rounds at the top of the leaderboard is, you know, a handful of places, but like you have the fitness to do that on top of the leaderboard score, but your execution was subpar. And, you know, you realize that like the way you put the jump rope down was stupid or you set up a little too far, you know, further than necessary apart from each thing. Like, you know, you have well, the I mean, full plan. A, and so like you think about a, how you execute essentially and is it clean as it could be? Yeah. I mean, in a workout like that, you were like the difference between nine and a half rounds and 10 rounds is actually like, might be hundreds of places like yeah, if you're in that be. in that style of workout you get back to your jump rope where you can just rack up reps just purely like you just executed better but you you got a hundred more reps than somebody else who was really close by but just didn't execute nearly as cleanly to, to put it in your terms as they could have yeah my mind goes to I'm still really, I've been like going around asking other people about the idea of whether killer instinct can be developed or uncovered, um, just to try to get, um, more perspective on the topic. And my mind goes to like Kobe shows up at Rikers, um, like, like just these, these moments where you see that competitive spirit, Tom Brady spiked the fucking monopoly board off his mom's head at Christmas. Like just these things where this idea of this is who this human is. Um, that's why I went this morning and looked at the open leaderboard over the last like four or five years. And the people that I would say embody that idea of killer instinct like surprise, surprise, where do you think they were on that leaderboard, even though, quote unquote, the open doesn't matter because that level of competitive spirit and fire and confidence um, is, you know, it's in the mode of how you do anything is how you do everything a little bit. But it's it's such a unique mindset where someone is going to be able to will themselves to do something um, that like. I would love to see an athlete, a CrossFit Games athlete that I'm trying to like work with them on this specific thing. I would love to see them take the open 
seriously for that reason specifically. Can I ask this of myself? Do I consider this a worthy competition? All of the best people in the world are, you know, here with me doing this. Um, can I tap into that? Can I actually like start to develop this, start to look at it from this point of view? Because you guys talked about it a little bit. Like some people go from either training alone or training with the same couple of people to training with four or five people and really start to kind of lose their shit a little bit. And that extrapolates out to how are you going to do when you start comparing yourself to thousands of people? How are you going to start to do when they tell you if you don't do this well in this workout, you don't get to advance? Um, so I think it's honestly just another version of saying it's a dress rehearsal. Um, but that seems like a little too light of a statement if we're using the idea of killer instinct, like being able to show up and attack because that's just what you do. Yeah, I mean, you just don't do that in training as often. Like these athletes that we're talking about have, have logged like hundreds and hundreds of hours doing fucking squat cleans and handstand pushups and rowing intervals. And it's, it's never for those athletes. It's, it's never a matter of physical capacity. It's just how often are you training that, that mental side of the equation when it comes to like execution, do you crumble when the lights go on and those things do, like require practice. And I, I don't know whether you can develop or train the killer instinct that you talk about drew, but, um, there's there's sure there's, there's certainly one way to not train it and that's to not take something <laughs> like the opportunity of the open seriously enough it's like if that doesn't register on the scale for you like what does and well, if it's only the crossfit games or it's only semifinals like and you're putting a lot of eggs in the basket of like i'll be good when it's act when it actually matters and it's like will ya i'm thinking of the athletes that that's what's missing for them. There are a handful of athletes in the sport when you watch them and you see them, you know, kind of in the warm up area, pre workout, post workout, throughout the weekend. You can tell that the mental aspect of it is what's missing from their game. They check all the boxes off in terms of skill, strength, endurance, power, all of that. Um, and a lot of them come in whatever. 30th, 40th, 50th, 60th, 70th, 80th, 200th in the open. And to me, I'm like drawing the connection between those two things. It doesn't matter. I'm not going to go hard, like that sort of thing. And that narrative, I think, doesn't help you develop the thing that you're trying to get better at. It just really puts you back in the exact same position you've been in year after year. And you're going to rely on the fact that you are fitness-wise capable of doing better but if you keep developing that and not this side of things, how well are you actually going to do? The best don't say that shit. You don't hear the best in the sport ever saying that type of stuff. No. I'm just going to run you my own not. race. Uh, I didn't try don't that start. hard. Don't it wasn't you a good fucking start for me. with me. <laughs> I don't say that shit. It's so funny when, when athletes say that to me now, they have, they like have the like longest like pretense. They're like, okay, hear me out. I know you don't like this saying, but like for this event specifically, and it's like context matters when it comes to that conversation. But yes, I'm going to run my own race when it's just an actual race with other people. Like hopefully your race run is your the own one race to fucking too. last place. <laughs> um, run your own race to last place. Training during the open. This Do has it. been a hot topic <laughs> for years. Luckily, the open is now sort of quarterfinals and quarterfinals is like all at once. We don't have to deal with it as much as we used to, I think. I think when the Open, especially when it was like the Open gets you to the CrossFit Games and it was spread out over weeks, it was like, I'm going to let myself deteriorate um, into IBS, zone, uh, zone Diet Drew, by the end of this thing. Uh, it's not going to go that well. Um, if you dare do an extra bite calorie in that warm-up, you'll just don't explode. Don't fucking do it. Don't you do it. So training during the Open, obviously it matters what the Open is to you specifically, um, but the good thing is open volume at misfitathletics.com is a lift in a conditioning piece, right? And I think Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, lift conditioning, um, you know, maybe there's a workout that's got like 
I don't know, high rep pistols or double unders that you would want to try to stay away from. But for the most part, you could go in and execute on that. Stay away from it. Don't you do it. (laughs) Do what? Don't Don't do do any pistols or double unders during the open. Um, To those. But like you could just go in and do a lift in a Metcon Monday through Wednesday and then be a very good version of yourself on Friday. You guys agree with that? Yes. Yeah. Stay Quarterfinals that athletes, that's when it starts to get um, interesting. It's it's very hard for us now with the 10% to 25% to give advice for that like group of people. Huge spectrum. Yeah. There's like five different types of athletes um, that we could, you know, you know, make like an athlete profile for. So it's it's not the easiest thing in the world. But um, if you're like really like all in on trying to, if you, you know, went and did the math and you were 20% or 30% last year and you're trying to get after it, I think something very similar to what we just talked about, that open athlete volume would be a really good idea. Um, but the question that we always used to ask related to this topic is when do you personally feel your best? As an athlete, when during the off season are you going through things and you're like, oh, wow, like I've hit my stride. This is the best workout that I've done. Um, and that the answer to that could be like the beginning of a phase after a deload, after a primer week. Um, and then for some people, it's like right smack in the middle of the phase. Like I've just hit my groove and like that, even though I've been sore and maybe a little bit beat down from, you know, the lifting or whatever, that workout, like where I really felt like I was making the most progress was actually on a Wednesday or a Saturday or something like that. So, um, I guess long story long, like you got to keep like that stuff going. You got to stay. Yeah. You have to continue to do that. I think it is an important question to ask. I think, I think the answer to that question is different for different athletes. Like there is, there are certain parts of CrossFit that are very, if you don't use it, you lose it. Um, What would you guys say to that? Like if you were thinking about when you feel your best, like what does the surrounding weeks, what do they look like in terms of training? Because obviously when you're overreaching like a lot, that's not going to be the case. But what's the sweet spot for you guys training wise? Personally, I would lean towards what you already described, the lift, the Metcon, and then either bitch work or accessory or, you know, maybe once a week do both if I'm feeling a little bit good. But it, during that period, it makes little sense to me to try to overreach unless I know I have a chance the next stage. Like that athlete that might have that. Um, so you're adding a third piece three, four days a week? Or yeah, a five? I mean, I mean, yeah, so maybe my, you know, my normal training is somewhere between an hour to 90 minutes most days. I might add another 30 minutes of something. Like beyond that, there's diminished returns with my lifestyle currently that like I'm not going to be able to recover well enough to make that worthwhile. So I'm not going to do more than that. And, you know, priorities have shifted a little bit, but at the same time, like I would like to be really fit during those periods. So I would just do enough to make sure that the, you know, proverbial axe is staying sharp without overreaching and le- you know, getting into that quarterfinals weekend and just feeling like I got some really good training in mind under my belt, but I don't feel very good going into this. For me, it's, I think it's less dependent on where we are in the phase and more specific to like where I am in my training week, literally. Mm. Um, and again, not maybe the best litmus test for this question because I wouldn't classify myself as a competitor. And I do lately I've been Monday through Friday. I don't train on Saturday or Sunday for, for more personal reasons than anything, but, um, I'm usually pretty beat up by Thursday or Friday. Uh, and our affiliate programming does a pretty good job of staying balanced enough that I can like, that I'll come in and still be able to perform, but I'm definitely like low running on running on low, um, by the time Thursday and Friday rolls around. So, and typically feel the best (laughs) coming off of, you know, either Monday or Tuesday, depending my weekend is not just like sit on the couch and do nothing like it's partially because i'll usually you know i might have a men's league hockey game on sunday so there is some form of movement i'm usually golfing on friday or or on saturday or and or sunday um so there is still some movement think about it for the crossfitter as active recovery um but for me it's coming off of like coming off of a rest day or 
only like one training day. As soon as I've got multiple training days behind me, um, the just the energy meter just continues to kind of tick downward until I until I hit that refuel point. So for me, like expecting to do the open workouts on Thursday, probably for for you know for us, I'll you know Wednesday will probably turn into a rest day or just a recovery day. And that's how we sure you and I have typically done that in the past, but yep. um, just making sure that like, I feel good within my week. Yeah, and I think that's a good day before is a good idea for us. I think that allows us to stay feeling good, feeling loose, feeling limber. Honestly, without... like I feel usually felt pretty good when we did something the day of too, we might do like the primer lift and a short mm. Metcon, like in the morning, like on Thursday morning, um, or take, you know, take class or whatever and tweak it a little bit. But, um, yeah, OG I think just, Cody just... Mooney show up at the venue in the morning, do a hundred cal assault bike at like moderate pace and then go back to the hotel. He's like, I just feel way better the rest of the day having that under 20, my belt. Twenty twenty. Yeah, you don't want to know Rich how froning, long it took just him. doing <laughs> doing workouts during regionals. Like <laughs> Yeah. Holy shit. Yeah. <laughs> Do regional um, workouts. Yeah, I gotta try. All right. I'm gonna I'm gonna put you guys Hunter, I'm gonna put you on the spot here. Um you are going to write an open workout right now. Okay. It can be real basic. Okay. And then we're going to talk about how you would break down said workout. So make sure you know the uh, cadence of the movements, that sort of thing. So it's well, really uh, important. Do I have any parameters here? Uh, sure. You can give them parameters if you want. You can give them duration, couplet, triplet. Mm, let's go sub 15 minutes, couplet. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Cue up that music, Ted. You said you said keeping it keeping it pretty simple. Yeah, something that will be easy to easier to break down. <laughs> something that Ted won't have to cut four minutes out of this podcast. <laughs> Jeopardy music. <laughs> it's pretty dope. What about Jeopardy on the recorder, though? That could be good. Ooh. I'll find that for next time. So the danger here is Hunter's really good at this and breaking it down, but Hunter could disappear on us for 47 minutes and then come back. Now we're good. We're good. <laughs> we're good. All right. Yeah. What you got? Very simple. 24.1 Am is? AMRAP, 12 minutes, 10 deadlifts. 225, 155, 10 bar facing burpees. Oh, what the fuck? <laughs> okay. So, <No. laughs> easy. This gets announced. Where, for you guys, where does your mind go? So, you're thinking about your athletes. Well, actually, the context is a little bit different. Normally, when these types of workouts get announced, you guys are thinking about doing it yourself, um, which brings a certain level of anxiety and bias into this but Spark let's say this gets announced hemorrhoids. and you're not yeah you're not doing um you're not doing the open announcement you're just getting ready to go to all your remote athletes mm -hmm. and start to talk through this where does your mind go first when you're breaking down a workout is it if it's an amrap is it total volume um like what can be done what's a score range where does your mind go first what can be done how long do things take and what is the upper limit of human capacity in my best estimate? Yeah. Uh, I'll think the same thing. What is the, I typically go like, what's the best possible score and then let's factor in a little bit of fatigue and what's realistic. Um, for this workout in particular, I would probably reference previous, our previous deadlift burpee bar facing burpee workout, which was a couple of years ago that, one up to 10 and back down to one of uh of reps which was similar time domains going to result in a similar total volume so doing that sort of thing and then from there i'd start to maybe think about it in in different terms as far as like is this emomable could someone do a 12 minute <laughs> emom of 10 10 deadlifts and 10 burpees or you know trying to 
basically trying to poke holes in my my initial estimate and then like well if somebody did 12 rounds of 10 and 10 that's 120 deadlifts and 120 burpees and that's within that's a lot but that's within like kind of what i would classify as like the acceptable range of what we've seen from crossfit and just in general from in in programming so that's where i would start to to go with that and then i'll go further into the weeds with like okay this is a hinging movement and a burpee does me or my athlete does their back explode on this combination of movements? Because that's a common, pretty common complaint, right? Sorry. And historical too data, too. You could look, again, like you sort of alluded to there, like what did someone do the 1 to 10 back to 1 in? And someone fucking did it in like exactly. 8 minutes. And you're yep. like, fuck, all right, so that's 110 of both things in 8 minutes. You give them 4 more minutes. Granted, yep. it's very different when you go 1 to 10 back to 1 versus 10 every single time. Like how much more could there realistically be in that time domain? Yep. Because I'm trying to think of sucks. how someone would look at this that doesn't normally do this sort of exercise. And sometimes when we're writing a workout, especially for like um, competition prep, it becomes a bit more obscure as we go, as we start to add more elements. And I will sanity check my time domain literally by going to YouTube and finding a workout that like, like we, there are so many examples. There's so many like videos online of like, like you could find very easily could go in and like find an open workout like the one Hunter referenced. You could find, you just go to YouTube and type in deadlift burpee like workout and you can see a competitor go through these things. And a lot of times it's, you know, no Olsen or whoever, like someone at an extremely high level and you can like stopwatch a set yeah. of 10 225 deadlifts and be like, okay, like him specifically, he moves very fast um, in a lot of his movements, especially at the beginning of a workout. But like, that's where you can set those upper limit parameters. So you can go in and say 10 deadlifts takes whatever, 15 seconds. 13 seconds. <laughs> yeah, and you go in and you, and you write that down and it's like, okay, that many seconds, you know, during the EMOM, how will that change? You can do the exact same thing with the bar facing burpees. You can watch someone do a like fatigued set of bar facing burpees. Now you have established a round. <laughs> yeah. And then you're asking yourself as you're going through it, like, okay, like I'm going to watch them also take a transition. And like in my mind, it might feel like seven seconds and it's two, or it might feel like two seconds and it's seven, but you can watch these things and you can watch them throughout a workout. You can, you know, sort of fast forward a little bit and be like, okay, how does this transition look here? And again, I'm typically doing that on a workout where an athlete might need to stop a little bit more. Um, but like, that is where you can start doing this and you can do it with almost any movement. Um, and then if you enjoy doing math or you're comfortable with doing math, you can, historical context is great. Because a lot of times in the open, we are given workouts where we can go pull something from a previous open workout or a previous quarterfinals workout. And you can go in and be like, well, the total volume of this workout is very similar to this one. So now I know what this is going to be, what this is going to look like. Certainly a lot easier with workouts like this one which are a little bit lower skill and just the you know, i think it's a good place to the start though is, to like learn. yeah no i think that's yeah. the easiest place to start for sure is that and it, it's typically like a i would say i would also say part of this process is like and if you're an athlete doing this on your own a workout like that pops up like a practice round or two absolutely has to be part of your game plan like look at yep. the clock i do this with my affiliate athletes all the time it's like okay you're gonna do we're gonna do one round of 10 deadlifts and 10 bar facing burpees i'm gonna start the clock i'm gonna turn the music up it's like we're pressing three two one go look at the clock when you're done it's like okay you just did a a 36 second round you are on pace for the fastest 20 the rounds best, good job the best score <laughs> in the world at this 6 30 p.m class on monday i have I have good news and I have bad news. The good news is that that was really impressive. The bad news is, is that you'll be dead in three minutes if you try to do that. So like we can, we have to do the math. We have to do, maybe it's a practice round. It's like, well, that round actually only took me 35 seconds, but that is absolutely not sustainable. If I do a round every 45 seconds, what does that yield? It's like, 
well, that actually gets me a better score than Pat Vellner, who just did the announcement, and I'm no Pat Vellner. So maybe every 45 seconds is the wrong play, and you can start to dial in from there. And obviously, once we get into higher skill gymnastics and stuff that... I think he brought that up because his score was so close to Vellner last year in the burpee pull-up workout? I'm just saying. It wasn't... <laughs> Coming for you, Pat. It wasn't that far <laughs> from Rich Froning and the deadlift burpee workout. I mean, I could be... Could be... Was it... Oh, it was the power snatch burpee. Which one? Remember that oh, one? Oh, the 10 rounds of 8 and 10? 10 rounds of 8 and 10. Yeah. Oh. Oh, I think you're talking I, about I something totally different. One. No. Yeah. But um, I remember the deadlift ladder. I don't know. Just... I think... A good segue here is you guys talked about potentially, and I want you to elaborate a little bit, sure. Um, warming up for a single workout is kind of weird and very different in the co- CrossFit space in terms of competition, right? Like normally we are showing up to a day of competition or you're coming into a day of qualifier workouts, that sort of thing. It is very unique to be like, what is the absolute best scenario for like, I want to crush one workout that could be five minutes long in an entire day. Like, that's my number one goal. Um, do you guys think about that from the perspective of, like, like what were you talking about in terms of doing something earlier in the day on the open workout day? What did you guys I mean, do typically? Personally, you from... feel like you took class sometimes, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. A lot of times we would do the primer in class, which would typically be like an Olympic lift and then like a short triplet. And sometimes we would just do the lift and sometimes we would do the triplet because it was meant to be like, move your body fast through long ranges of motion, not get sore, get the blood pumping. And both of us typically feel a little better once we've done something first. So like, you know, our preference is if there's two things in class and it's a lift and a Metcon, Hunter and I typically will go do the Metcon first after we warm up because we know we'll feel better for the barbell that follows. Um, and that's just, you know, personal bias there. I, I like to get moving. I like to get sweaty. I like to make sure things are really kind of broken in before I start, because I think the anxiety of I'm going to wear my energy is just a, you know, a silly athlete thing that a lot of athletes go through. Like if I do three more kettlebell swings, I can't do a set of seven muscle ups. It's like being fucking ridiculous. You need to make sure your body feels as good as humanly possible. So you know, our normal, our normal routine after doing class in the morning is right around the time they're getting ready to announce the workout. We'll go over and do 10 minutes on the C2 bike, five minutes on the ski erg, you know, typical locomotion patterns of fucking hinging and squatting and pressing and just making sure like all the angles and joints that potentially get put through in the workout are warm. And then, you know, once the workout's announced, we'll watch it for a few minutes and then go dial in those motor patterns a little bit more refined to the specific movements that are in the workout. But I really find that I feel better if I've moved earlier in the day as opposed to like, all right, let's go. That never works well for me. The higher the stakes get for the athlete, the more I think time they need between that moment and like when they need to ask these questions. Hmm. Like we need to ask a lot of really good questions while you're still sane, while you're still keeping your shit together. So it's (laughs) February 20th. Right now, although it's not February 20th. What is it? It's February 26th. Um, It's the future. Just a few days before. We're asking these questions, and it's like, okay, you're listening to this podcast. The open jitters aren't really here yet. They haven't announced it. When do you typically feel your best within a given day? So if you are doing multiple workouts in a day, is it always like work? The very first workout of the day after X type of warm up is the one where I can really get after it. And that could be the answer to your question for a million different reasons. You know, know, what's your sleep schedule? When do you get to train? You know, have you gone to work already? Have you exhausted certain resources already? But I know, like, I get a lot of excited athletes sending me scores in the evening on their, you know, third piece of the day, that sort of thing. Like, so paying attention to those things while you're training is really important. And again, as we go all the way back through this whole list and then the the stuff that we've got, you know, coming up, like ask yourself these questions when you're feeling good about your sanity level in terms of actually answering the questions. Yeah. I think you have an entire season of training to figure out when you feel the best, what combinations of things before X thing. Like if you're truly paying attention and dialing your athlete IQ, you know 
what type of things make you feel like you perform your best in a Metcon, and that's our sport, our Metcons. Like that's exactly what we do in these parts of the season. You know, rarely do you get a lift in isolation. Like probably only in the quarterfinals or semifinals will you get in a lift in isolation. So you need to hopefully reverse engineer the days that you feel the most amazing and be like, all right, how can I do that before said? qualifier workout or said open workout quarter quarterfinals workout so that I can hammer it. And if you don't know that by now, like you're, what are you, you're not paying attention to the right things. You're too obsessed with maybe your score or how much weight you're lifting instead of like what makes me feel the best so I can perform my best. I would definitely rather see an athlete warm up way more and take a bigger gap between warming up and working out. Um, if they are scared of the whole, like, you know, I did seven assault bike calories and now I'm not going to be able to do a burpee. I would rather see an athlete like that extend their warm up out and really go through blood flow and, you know, the 15 to 20 minutes on machines and stretching and all that and just give themselves enough time to feel like themselves again um, versus someone who's like terrified of doing it and half asses it and does the whatever prime, a fake primer and then waits three minutes and does the workout. <laughs> yeah, I think I think that athlete probably benefits the most from like movement during the day, like well before yeah. well beforehand. It's just bringing that. It's like if the first heart rate spike is you know the announcement of the open, and the second heart rate spike is three, two, one, go. You know that you're, we're already in a hole. And I think you're like that athlete is the athlete who like I'm anxious the op like I'm anxious about that the workout's been announced. And therefore, I'm not focusing heavily on my warm up. I'm just kind of like going through the motions, but in my head, really nervous and thinking about this workout. And you've you're missing not not being present enough to, you know, check in. Like, oh wow, I actually didn't get my heart rate up enough, and this is a really gnarly workout on you know metabolically, or you know my hips are really tight, but like oh, fuck it, I gotta go do other thing. Like I'm, I'm anxious, I'm nervous, I'm not even gonna worry about opening up my hips. Like they'll be fine. It's like those are the people in my mind who need, who would benefit from that. Like, you know, couple hours before movement or the really extended warm up that goes before like before the open workout. All right, now it's time to execute on the workout and I'm thinking um, the benefits and the evils of two sides to the same coin so one side is like we got to turn the dial up a little bit we got to turn the intensity up um but of course we need to spread that adrenaline out and it's really like especially in a medium to long workout a lot of it is about this is just going to hurt a little bit more and then a little bit more and then a little bit more and we're gonna have to be ready for that pain tolerance um, to be something that we're not going to back off of, that we're going to kind of lean into a little bit. Um, the other side of that coin is like, fuck yeah, the Open's here. Um, Hunter, please get Testify um, ready on the iPod. I'm going to go over in the <laughs> corner here, and I'm going to crawl into a cannon. And sure, just light the fuse for me at 3, 2, 1, go. Hunter, hit play. And that 35-second round... Check this Watch shit this out. Shit. Yeah, check this shit out. Yeah. Um, and then you have a three minute and 50 second round at some point check within this shit the workout. Out. <laughs> um, Still checking it out. Still man, going. I mean, obviously this is very much like athlete IQ in motion. Um, but there are some athletes that really do get geeked up and show the body language of that killer instinct and then just do some dumb shit that could never be done by anybody or sustained by anybody. Um, and that to me is a fascinating phenomenon when it happens to the same people over and over and over. Like, what are we, what are we trying to accomplish here? Like, did you jump from 400th to first this year and I just didn't like know about it or like, what are we up to? Hey, you can't throw away your athlete IQ on game day. Hey, how about that? <laughs> I mean, I feel like it might be super important on that day specifically. Yeah, you might want to use it right? on that day. Yeah, I mean, it's exactly like what you my could nerd goes. your way to a better score than a lot of people. Fuck yeah, for sure. You, you definitely understand can. the workout. You understand how to move through it. How long things are going to take. You know your cadence on movements. You know time domain and how few feel doing those things, and know when you should feel kind of bad, and then pretty bad and then really bad and then fuck I'm going to die soon but it's almost over like you got to know 
all of this information. So there's like objective data points, like how long things take, as well as how I should feel during the workout. And if you haven't experienced that enough to know that information, like, you know, kind of shame on you for not paying attention to things that matter. Again, I just always go back to the athlete who's obsessed with the, the score in October instead of the performance in fucking March, April, May, and beyond. I think that athlete's the one who needs a, needs a caddy so to speak needs either a coach or Fact. a training partner or someone say? someone to someone a caddy a golf golf caddy caddy yeah. like if you i've gotten pretty deep into the weeds a caddy's job is pretty gnarly um but <laughs> bottom guy. line is like helping <laughs> all i can think of is happy gilmore <laughs> seminar huh you're fired <laughs> puts the cracker down <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> i should just try i should just try to hit it in the hole every time <laughs> uh, the no, it's just having, you know, here, hey, here's my plan. Some trusted advisor, <laughs> coach, athlete, peer, training partner, whatever. Give me a sanity to check on this plan. It's like, well, when's the last time you opened up with 15 muscle ups in a Metcon? It's check like, this oh, shit out. It's, it's going to be today, huh? It's like, wrong oh, <laughs> like, bad plan. We need to, we need to going run, unbroken. either run, you know, the plan by that, your caddy, whether that's a coach or a, you know, a, confidant whatever it is and then having somebody there during execution to help out with that sort of thing especially in those merry-go-round style workouts you know 10 burpees 10 deadlifts whatever it's like hey you're you're currently at world record pace you are not the fittest human on earth like what what do we we need you need somebody who can pay attention to whether it's the clock the sets that you're doing the rest that you're taking in between those reps so that you can just focus on the execution side of things and i think that's even more important like the higher the stakes get as far as like how close you are to qualifying for something else or um you know a, a certain placement or, or whatever but i think you need to have those are the athletes who need to have a thought out plan that's maybe run by somebody else um that can tell you like, Hey, let's do maybe like nine and six instead of 15 unbroken to start, because I know you really want to, but I think it's a bad idea and having, just having somebody who can put that athlete in slap him around get, a little bit, slap him. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. Slap him around, knock a little bit of sense into him. Just make sure that the, you know, that they're not about to do something stupid when they're perfectly capable of doing something slightly less stupid and therefore yielding a way better score. You know what sucks? When you're really fit and you have a really dumb plan and then you do that dumb plan and then you feel worse about yourself and it's like a negative feedback loop which can really sour an athlete going into the following week of the Open and the following week and then a fucking entire season is lost where you you could have been that semifinals athlete if you had just had a good plan in week one of the open that carried over to week two to carry it over to week three to quarterfinals. But I did 15 and then like, unbroken to start dog. What about that? Cool. that is, you can put that on your wall. Congratulations. <laughs> that's, that is one thing that's really weird about CrossFit though, is you can't like, you can't really be a showman <clears throat> in most instances, like crushing a 20 minute AMRAP is the most boring shit ever. People are like, yeah. is this video stitched together? Like in a lot of other sports, you work so hard and you wanna go put that out on display. And especially within an AMRAP because you can't even tell who's racing who, what's going on, what round are you on, especially in a gym, um, that can be challenging. And I think there are some people who thrive on the idea of competition when there are other people there and there are implications of being able to like show their work off. And I think those people struggle a little bit when it's three, two, one, go. And they basically just need to execute really well. And for maybe the final six minutes, like deal with the fact that it hurts more than it normally does in training. Yeah. I think the person you're probably not paying as much attention to when you're, if you know, if you're looking at a gym floor of 10 athletes, you know, in class doing the affiliate workout, it's like, the person that people are paying attention to the most is like, hmm, like, I wonder when that guy's going to fall apart. Cause it's like, that's the shiny object. The one who's going to win is just kind of cruising along. Like yeah. you said, it's or a, you watch it's like the it's big not fun sets, to watch. big rest guy because it's fun to watch. Yeah. It's like, Oh wow. Did you see how big of a set of muscle ups he did? And it's like, it's like, congratulations. Like you just got passed by the dude who did six, four, two, two, one. 
Because you think about Kenzie and that muscle up workout from years ago. She's fucking worried she's not gonna fucking do very do very well in the workout because she can't do more than like five fucking muscle ups at a time. And fucking standing know, up like, off she the came lower, in like third. resting during your muscle ups. You out of your mind, Kenzie? Unbelievable. Yeah. Um, I have a, a correlation. We got to check in on Sherb's rowing journey. Sherb, do we? Went faster <laughs> on a harder piece, proving Oops. that. Um, Made I was up. right and he was wrong um, but him being wrong in this scenario is him being fitter so I think he can live with it um, I want to use that as an example because I think people will wonder if they've felt what I'm talking about before in terms of the like like <coughs> Sherb explain to me like what the workout was and how you felt round to round uh, four rounds 900 meter row so three ish minutes of rowing rest three and a half minutes um went in with the target of i'm gonna try to hold a 143 based on the fact that i barely held a 142 last time in the rowing and that was the 66 calories which was probably like 245 250 so like 10 to 15 seconds this this event was 10 to 15 seconds longer so i was like all right i'm gonna start at a 143 for fucking 700 of the 900 meters and if i feel good i'll push a tiny bit harder at the end um so on round one i set the the, the benchmark at like a 141 like nine i think and i was like all right that sucked for the last minute so like the last third of the 900 meters suck pretty bad but like I'm gonna see how I feel when I go on the rower after my my flushing bike. So I'd you know leave the rower, take a sip of water, go sit on the C2 bike, ride it for two minutes, take another sip of water, refocus my head, and then all right, I'm gonna go for it again. And then when I hit the second one, I went a little faster, and I said, all right, fuck, I'm halfway through already. The worst round is about to happen. I always think the second to last round of any sort of bitch work piece is literally the the hell that you have to kind of figure out. And when that's fucking <laughs> when that's 10 rounds, it's terrible. When it's three rounds, it's terrible. Like the second to last one is typically the hardest because the last one you can kind of always ante up because it's the last one. So I got through the second round, knew I could go about the same speed again. I think I held the exact same split in round three, like to the 10th of a second. And the last one, I was like, all right, there's a little bit of juice at the end. I'm going to try to hold on. And the thing that made it easier was the the fact that I realized pretty quickly in that I could do about 300 meters in a minute. So I had to like basically chunk out the effort in three chunks every single round. The first 300 meters, the middle 300 meters, and the last 300 meters. So the first 300 meters about like, hey, don't be an idiot. Start at a pace that's realistic, that's close to the goal pace you have at the end. The middle 300, all right, this is going to, you know, your blood's going to start to boil. And the last 300 is just a fucking gut check. Like you can do anything at this sort of pace for a minute if you can stay mentally focused. So that was the difference this time. And I think it was the more of the known factor and the more calculated starting pace that allowed to be more consistent. And I think my, my range of split went from like a one forty one nine to like a one forty one like three. So pretty tight splits. Two nuggets here. Number one, the 66 calorie was not an indictment of where your fitness is at, where your rowing is at. Bad like, day. <laughs> bad day. And you just went in and got it done afterwards. And luckily, you have enough historical context to say, I know what my gears are. I know what my ranges are. Like, I think I can go in and do this. Um, and then the other part here is just like, you can call upon the micro and the macro of you dealing with the pain tolerance in that type of workout. Like, if, if you were doing row sprints, you would never even be anywhere near a 141, right? Like, no. so there's no insinuation there that you like absolutely shot out of a cannon, but you knew that there was going to be pain within that. And like, you can think about that from a like round to round perspective within a workout, right? Like you were not only dealing with the fact that it was gonna get worse and worse as you went from your first 900 to your last 900, but you were also thinking about like, I can do this for a minute. Um, and then I can do this for a minute and then I can do this for a minute. And that's kind of that like one foot in front of the other uh, mentality that you can bring into these open workouts. Because again, that like level of intensity that can show up early on in the workout, I think can be alarming for people. Um, and we've tried a few different times to tease it out of Hunter, but that's one of the things that he's always been good at is you can see the writing is on the wall 
sometimes even five minutes into a 15 minute workout and he just kind of settles in and gets it done. And I know Hunter, you told me forever ago that like the one foot in front of the other in the military, like that's a helpful idea of like, well, I don't know if I can take a thousand more steps, but I can probably take one. So it's yeah. like, can you have that micro view of continuing to accomplish things and then can you think about stretching out that pain tolerance? And one of the easiest ways in my mind is looking back to bitch work pieces, ones that you executed well on. And you know what that feels like and you know that it sucks, but you still get it done. Yeah, I think like to Sherb's example, like experience is your bulwark for anxiety essentially so you have you've gone through this it's not an unknown the anxiety the anxiety isn't there because you don't know what to do the anxiety is there because like i remember doing this and i remember how it felt and like it's going to be unpleasant but there's no but there's not necessarily the anxiety of like i don't even know how to approach this workout and the more experiences you can bank both in you know bitch work type pieces those do a, an exceptional job of telling you how you might feel like physiologically at x point in a workout in an interval at x intensity or whatever and then also having the experience of you know how certain metcons feel from an execution standpoint because all of those experiences like at the end of the day when an open workout pops up when you know last year's open workout of wall walks box jumps and dumbbell snatches was that last year or the year before that was two years ago i think two years ago okay what I, use that workout it's like okay you've done all three of those movements they're all as straightforward and simple as it gets like where does the anxiety come into play it's like i don't know how hard to go or you know I, I just don't watching. have I don't have enough, everyone's watching. I don't have, or I don't, I didn't pay enough attention during my, during my gears pieces in bitch work or whatever, or doing, doing a 15 minute AMRAP, a 15 minute merry-go-round style AMRAP from phase three. But so having those experiences and trying to log them, whether it's like literally log them in a, in an app or a note or a on a piece of paper or whatever, or just mentally making a note of like, yeah, I remember that. I think that is your, your best kind of, you know, pre anxiety prevention tool is experience. I, I think the two goals that I had going into that, other than the fact that it's like Sunday, I'm a little beat up from the week of training is like, I'm going to start a more intelligent starting pace. Cause the last time I did that 66 calories, I think I overshot just a little bit for how I was feeling. So I said, I'm going to start at this pace. Cause I think I can hold this. And then two, trying to be tougher with the resiliency of like, is that it's how your suck. energy systems work? Can't you like, can't you just really ruin your workout at the beginning and then adjust and be fine? Yeah, it's usually the most uh, efficient way to deal with yeah. your training, but um, it's my favorite. You know, the, the, I'm going to start with 95 on this workout, but when it gets hard, I'll go down to 75 and I'll be fine. <laughs> I know you that fucking that'll work, won't. That'll work well. I know you fucking won't. So the goal of like going in there and being tougher in that. And then again, I think in workouts like that, chunking out efforts realizing you're okay after one minute you will be okay if you stay at the same pace for another minute or 30 seconds or 15 seconds whatever that interval is for you that was very mentally uh freeing to know that i could do this for one more minute you do this for 30 more seconds and knowing how long each you know time stamp equaled so one minute 300 meters or one minute 18 calories whatever that is for the, the bitch work piece but i thought that was really something that stayed me kept me engaged in what i was doing but also alleviated some of the anxiety of like all right this hurts but like guess what fuck it's gonna be over in a minute like you can do this for one more minute i was doing the um 20 minute ftp test on the bike recently and the final five minutes i felt very good about like how i was doing on it and you have that mental shift the difference of like oh, wow, I feel way better than I thought I was going to versus, like, can I keep doing this? And as I was riding, like, obviously, aver it's for average wattage. So, like, getting more watts at that point is pretty challenging. Um, and I kept pushing the pace a little bit more, and I would get the average watt to go up one. So, like, 207 to 208. 
and I start. I was literally candy machine Ooh, talking candy. out loud. Ooh. Like those are my those are my watts. Those are fucking mine. I'm not giving them back. So not only was nom, I not going to slow nom, down. Nom, 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 yeah, exactly. Nom, nom, I was nom. like, fuck. I think I might be able to fucking get up this uh, to get, get this up to 209, 210, something like that. And those moments when you have them in training are the ones that I think people need to learn to reverse engineer to find out what got you there. Like, hey, guess what? I, for the first 15 minutes, rode at a pace that was possible for me to do. Check. <laughs> like, that was a good idea. That's something that I haven't always been the best at. Um, so reverse engineering the simpler workouts first is a really good way to do it. Um, you guys have been listening to us for an hour and a half talk about the old CrossFit. Um, so I'm going to put a five-minute time limit on our final topic, which is how to reflect on a workout and whether you should redo the workout or not. I'll tackle the reflection just in terms of um, like looking at whether you would redo it and if you did, how it would go. Um, you're kind of doing a reverse version of how you would do the workout audit. So like hopefully whoever was your judge wrote down your split times during the workout. Like you're basically taking information and auditing your athlete IQ during that workout. Sometimes they just come up with a combination that feels kind of new and it hits you in a moment that you didn't think was going to happen. Um, so you want to be able to reflect. You want to go in and look at your splits. If you have a video, you can look at what happens, um, what's your movement cost later in the workout. Like, oh, wow, I was actually moving like shit and I like didn't keep it together. And I need during my redo, my coach to, you know, give me the old like feet hips during my chest to bar or like you're not, you know, you're not sprawling in your burpee or whatever it is. Um, but really try to get as much information as you can out of the workout um, in terms of the notes that you have. And if you feel like you executed pretty well, um, we've all done that like random different strategy that you end up at different checkpoints at different points in the workout and then you get almost the exact same score at the end because it's physics and it's an amount of work over a period of time and it's what your body is capable of doing. Those can be the moments where if you start to cook up something harebrained, um, maybe you don't redo the workout. Maybe it's not the best idea. Um, you guys referenced at the beginning of the podcast not redoing workouts. I don't know how I go back and forth on how I feel about this topic just because I like it when an athlete gets mad and tells me they want to redo a workout. Like, I like that element of it. Like, I wouldn't want it to distract from their season and all of that stuff. But in the grand scheme of things, when I know that they do four pieces a day, five days a week, if they want to do this workout again on a Monday to, like, ease their mind or because they're pissed, I'm probably Still a not good training talk piece, them out right? of it. Yeah, exactly. I'm probably yeah, not going to talk them out of it. I like that element. I just need – there needs to be a good reason. That That always is the – guiding light for the redo is do you have a good fucking reason if you're pissed sure great you want to be fucking bob in the corner when it doesn't fucking matter like probably do your training like move on from that but like well i, I, I mean i, I feel I like you got a caveat that like i'm pissed it's like okay like that's not very sophisticated like why are you pissed because <laughs> you, like say. you said you said you were gonna you said you were gonna break up the first set of 30 and you decided to go unbroken unbroken because they love like, to you know, do that we have the plan. Yeah. yeah we have Fuck your plans, plans. Right fucking here. So I think it's just like that. that's not a good enough. That there needs to be a follow-on to that, I guess. I, I don't want to interrupt you, sure, but I just feel like that it's like I mean, I was you're pretty pissed. Much like, my point. You're pi <laughs> okay. I mean, being pissed is like, that's fine. You, I, I would want like, why are you pissed? Like, well, because I didn't execute my plan. It's like, okay, that's maybe that's fair. So are you going to say that, on your redo you will execute your plan like <laughs> I'm, I'm ron, ron burgundy, burgundy question mark <laughs> are you gonna you gonna you're gonna, are you gonna do the do the exact same thing so i think yeah absolutely you have to have a good reason i think there's there can be there's value in like i made a poor strategic decision or i think like i just think that i could do better in the workout with a knowing with the information that i have now and a better plan with the intent of understanding like i think the open uh, doing 
having a redo in the open can be beneficial because you're way less likely to have a redo opportunity at quarterfinals and you don't get a redo opportunity at semifinals in the games. So ha being able to redo a workout that, you know, the exact same workout because you know, the test and retest thing is really valuable, but going from one day to a next, like there's obviously no gain in net fitness, but like you might be able to learn something about your yourself, your capacity, maybe, you know, whatever with a, with a better strategy or just going about it in a different way. So I think there's value in redoing for that reason. Um, but yeah, I, I could I could go I like either the idea way of on murdering it. a previous version of yourself. I can think of some like movies yeah, and for, TV shows sure. where there's like a dreamscape and the person kills their younger self or whatever. Like that's where my mind goes because if you are bringing you're doing the dress rehearsal and you're bringing that like anxiety ridden athlete back into the equation and then you have that feeling on a Sunday like no fuck that like I've I, I went back and looked at my results and similar workouts throughout the whole year and like I'm ready to rock like I can do this um, yeah there's something about like putting that person to rest like okay that's that's old yeah, me that's absolutely. me from last year bye bye all right uh final thoughts today prompt is one single piece of advice was that five minutes for anybody yeah it was exactly How do we do? five minutes oh nice one well, I mean, single just 12, piece 16 of to 12, advice. 21. If you are a regular listener of this podcast and you go to a CrossFit gym and you, you train and you follow competitive CrossFit programming, um, and then you're going to tell me that the open doesn't matter, uh, you're a fucking you're idiot. A fucking liar. Uh, it's like you, you've <laughs> lied to you. You have <laughs> been <fucking> liar. <laughs> you've been lying to yourself for an entire year. Uh, no, Holy I think smokes. the 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 point <laughs> is that if you have put so many eggs in the basket of development of yourself as an athlete, I think you owe it to yourself to sign up. We can. That's all. I'll say on sign up for the open. And then actually, like, try. Just put your best foot forward, and wherever you shake out, you do. And obvious. And there's like, there's always the underlying kind of like, hey, it's gonna be okay. There, you're probably, you know, assuming that you are gonna move on to quarterfinals. Like, it's not the end of the world if the workout didn't go as well as you thought it would. But the only way you're gonna know that the workout didn't go as well as you thought it would is if you try really hard in that workout. If it's like, if you kind of half-ass it, and then you're like, ah, I could do better. It's like, you don't fucking know that. Like, again, going back to your point, Drew, of like that person who like if they if you're if you're somebody who always says like it doesn't matter or like yeah i left a little bit in the tank like do did you do you have anything left in the tank because you haven't proven it and you're just saying it so like where's the where's the action here and i think every level of athlete from affiliate athlete to crossfit games athlete has something to benefit from going really fucking hard in workouts that are designed to just fucking bury you it's like that's the sport that's the sport side of crossfit you signed up for and that's all yeah and that's also like the that's also the affiliate side of crossfit like the intensity conversation like don't open up an entire podcast can of worms and go for another hour and a half but like that is the thing for an affiliate athlete. It's like, how's your intensity? Like, I, I, it's great that you come in and you like to sweat during class and whatnot, but like ultimately adaptation occurs through intensity. And regardless of what those goals are, whether it's lower body fat percentage or a higher placement in the open, intensity is that is that av is the is the route that you have to take to get there. And the open provides no better opportunity to test that. Um, that I can think of, especially because quarter, you know, that just the, the skill level and the difficulty goes up and therefore the intensity goes down for a lot of athletes at, at, you know, as the, as the level gets higher. So the open is the, the most accessible opportunity to really see what you've got when it's time to go hard. It's the Venn diagram of competitive CrossFit and CrossFit because it is yeah. competition, but it's one workout on one day. You go in, you execute on that workout, and you fucking go home. Like, we don't get opportunities for those worlds to, like, cross over that often. 
um, and taking advantage of it every year is super important. Yeah, I think it's Sorry, the sure. embodiment of what CrossFit <laughs> is. Don't rush your preparation on the day, on game day, when it matters most, when you've put in all of those fucking hours, all those long, terrible bitch work pieces, all those terrible lifting sessions, the things that you're like, why the fuck am I doing this? But you keep doing it anyways. And then you get to the open, you're like, crack the knuckles. All right, let's fucking throw down. Like, don't rush. Take the time. Warm up. Think about the workout. Think about your pacing. Think about your strategy. Think about what could go wrong and what you could fix, you know, try to get ahead of that to fix ahead of time so you're not in it and going, oh, fuck, should I have done seven, four, three on the bar muscle ups or should I have done fucking four, two, 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 two forever? Like, think about those things ahead of time so that you don't go into this and want to kick yourself at the end because you didn't think through something. You know, one of the things I always love to see of the person that's like, oh, I could have done better on the, you know, the thruster chest bar workout we see every year in the open. If I had just spent more time warming up my front rack for the thruster, it could have been a little easier. And I just think to him, like, why the fuck didn't you? Like, why? It takes fucking extra five minutes to make you feel better to do that. Do that. I'll Spend the time my front doing rack that. up next year. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, I just basically don't rush. Take your time. Think through things. Properly warm yourself up. Make sure you feel as good as physically possible. And then you're primed to run the best race that you can. And that's, again, essentially what you're being tested on. How fit are you and how clean a run can you have? You're going to act like a silly goose no matter what. <laughs> like like even you two. Like we're giving all of this advice no. and something happens. Like something happens when you have to compete and perform. And what I love as a coach that people should be able to do for themselves is to go back into fitter and find the sane version of you that gives some type of context to this workout. Time domain, movement patterns, whatever it is, think back to that day, think about how you warmed up, how you executed, what you thought about afterwards. Like I could have done this a little bit better. I could have done that a little bit better. There are like, you have this ridiculous, ridiculous journal and diary of proof of who you are and you can go back in time and call upon those things and then use them and hopefully there is someone in your corner that has been watching you that can give you the little bit of you know the pat on the back the attaboy like i've, I've seen how much time you've you know spent in your squat holds or working on your butterfly kip or whatever it is but at the end of the day if you take decent enough notes or if you like have good like recall, just go back and find the workout. You find the time domain, you can really see like what's going on. Um, Jesus, sure. <laughs> <laughs> you fucker. <laughs> um, so like really go back in time and think about how you can draw a correlation because again, there's something about what happens to the competitor when it's time for this to happen. And I think it's really important to bring yourself back to baseline and have context for what you're doing and then execute. Agreed. What do you think, Ted? What's your advice? Uh, I liked Hunter's advice. Try, just try. You could try. Try trying. You could try. I, try trying. I believe his advice was, you're a fucking idiot. I think oh, that was that's where I like we that. started. That's true. That's well, true. Well, I did say that. Idiot. So, All right. Well, um, <laughs> it's it's the open now. Do it. It's the open here in a few days. Um, you'll see some content coming out from us on how to tackle the workout. Um, I don't know logistically if... Big truck versus little fella um, <laughs> is going to happen every single week, but we sure hope it is. And we hope that you guys annoy them enough that they do it again. Um, and yeah, let's fucking that's go little, get after it. Hunter will do it for some golf that's, clubs. That's little buddy to you. Some little little golf buddy. clubs. My bad. Hunter's in. Yeah. Show some little respect. Buddy. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Misfit Podcast. Thank you to our show sponsors. Properfuel.co. Use the code word Misfit. Sharpentheaxco.com. Use your favorite athlete code misfitathletics.com for your individual programming needs and teammisfit.com for your affiliate programming needs. We'll see you next week. <laughs>